for having me over at the Institute. It's a privilege. I've never been to Belgrade, although I've been in my books uh, writing about uh, language politics uh, also in the Balkans. And so now I have the privilege to see the places I've been writing about. And uh, today I will be talking about an event which was pretty momentous, uh, but uh, strangely it is forgotten, meaning this kind of expulsion of uh, Bulgarian Turks in the summer of 1989. Uh, how did I come to this uh, topic? Uh, when I came to the University of St. Andrews, uh, I was tasked with teaching uh, this kind of uh, team taught uh, module for the first year students about the modern history of the world, fine. And me coming from Poland, they told me, okay, you will teach the 1989 uh, revolution. So, yeah, here you are. You have this kind of uh, revolutions uh, sorry, uh, in, uh, in, in Warsaw or in Bucharest. These images are immediately recognizable and uh, it makes sense. Uh, so, basically, you could say if you want a, a, a typology of how regime change uh, proceeded after the end of communism, you could have peaceful revolution, violent revolution, a round table, peaceful negotiations, and the breakups of uh, states. However, when it comes to Bulgaria, the most popular image uh, which illustrates the end of communism in Bulgaria is that, which does not uh, actually fit any of these typologies and is pretty flabbergasting, although in uh, history books it's offered as an explanation. And myself, I was scratching my head. What was that? Because uh, something which is called Goliamata Promena, the big change, meaning the end of communism, which is obviously a, a, a phrase which is uh, connected to the uh, German uh, phrase, uh, Wende, the change. But uh, this change, which happened uh, in, uh, on the 10th of November 1989, was not really momentous and was not really changing anything. It was one communist leader relieving uh, another communist leader of power. So where is this change, you know? I just wondered. So if the 10th of November, when there was a kind of palace coup against uh, Zhivkov, the dictator of, of uh, 35 years, so during uh, the majority of the time when uh, communist Bulgaria existed, if it's really something, it's not the beginning of the end of communism, it's somewhere in the middle of the uh, end of communism in Bulgaria. But if it's not a cause of the end of communism uh, in Bulgaria, what was the cause? And uh, I propose that uh, the cause uh, of uh, uh, ending communist system in Bulgaria was the expulsion of 360,000 Turks and Muslims uh, between late May and late August in 1989 in Bulgaria. And, uh, uh, and the, 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 the relieving of Zhivkov of his power was somewhere in the middle. And 
the expulsion was followed actually by the return of uh, almost half of the expellees. And these two events, the expulsion and the return of the expellees, were causing and shaping the end uh, of communism in Bulgaria uh, as well as the democratization in Bulgaria. If you look at it, you know, from this uh, purely chronological uh, point of view, you can, you can see that Zhivkov was deposed in the middle, that first you had these protests of uh, mass protests of tens of thousands, around 60,000 people in Bulgaria, Muslims and Turks against the forced assimilation, which was uh, symbolized by the forced changes uh, of Muslim sounding, Arabic sounding names of uh, these Muslims and Turks in Bulgaria. Uh, and these uh, protests were, were followed immediately by the expulsion. The expulsions led to the deposition of Zhivkov because, among other things, the expulsions uh, destabilized the politics and economy of the country. And then you had the return of expellees. If you want a, a more exact timeline of uh, the, the end of communism and the beginning of democratization in Bulgaria, uh, after the deposition of Zhivkov, you have the freeing of Ahmed Doan, who uh, was the leader of the Turkish slash Muslim opposition in the latter half of the 1980s, co-organized or organized the mass protest in April 1989, and uh, in uh, January established uh, the uh, movement for rights and freedom this MRF uh, party, which became the most important party in post-communist Bulgaria from the point of view that it is the only party which has remained unchanged, didn't splinter, didn't change the name until today, and has consistently been either in the ruling coalitions or was supporting a given ruling coalition in the parliament. So, in a way, it has been the pillar of democratization of Bulgaria and remains as such until uh, today. So once again, what were the main uh, factors uh, uh, conditioning the situation in which uh, the, uh, the systemic transition was taking place in Bulgaria? So I've already mentioned the return of the expellees. And this return of expellees was overlapping with the violent, maybe not in deeds, but violent in words, uh, demonstrations of hundreds of thousands, literally hundreds of thousands of uh, ethnic Bulgarians uh, who were against the return of these uh, Turks. And actually, this was the situation which could lead to the development similar to what happened in Yugoslavia after 1991, but the politicians, uh, both uh, ethnic Bulgarians and Muslim, uh, and, uh, Muslim Bulgarians, uh, negotiated uh, the transition in such a way that it didn't uh, lead uh, to uh, violence which would split the country. Anyway, that's a missing picture. <laughs> When you look at it, probably you would say it's somewhere else than Bulgaria, but uh, that was uh, the biggest uh, unreported uh, event, uh, or maybe it was reported, uh, but kind of forgotten, because uh, in the 1989, the pride uh, of the space in newspapers and on TV was taken by the events in Poland, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, East Germany, West Germany, and so on. So Bulgaria and Romania. Bulgaria was out of the picture. However, which is of import, uh, the events were uh, reported on front pages of newspapers in Turkey, which is understandable, and in Yugoslavia. Here you have, for instance, the uh, one article from many uh, from the Daily Politica, which was on the uh, first uh, page. Well, uh, a renowned Bulgarian historian and economist, uh, Rumen Avramov, is criticizing my thesis that without this expulsion, uh, 
the communist system in Bulgaria would have anyway collapsed, which is true. I agree with him because it was due to the decision of Mikhail Gorbachev that he would not be sending troops of the Warsaw Pact or the Red Army just to prop up <coughs> the system. He simply agreed that uh, uh, the countries of the Soviet bloc may go their own separate uh, ways. However, if the expulsion and return of expellees had not happened, the transition in Bulgaria would have been different. So that's why it's important to remember what was the cause of the end of the uh, of communists and what shaped the systemic transition in Bulgaria, and it is forgotten. So once again, some more pictures which I actually showed to my students back at St. Andrews, and they were identifying these pictures like this, you know. No one actually realized this was the expulsion in uh, 1989 from Bulgaria uh, to uh, to Turkey, and some people were saying it was Bosnia, it was Nagorno-Karabakh, and so on and so on. Even some were proposing that, that these are Syrian refugees, yeah. Because, well, refugee situations look like that. Expulsions look like that in the modern uh, world in Europe. Worryingly, when I realized that uh, popular books of history of the of the end of communism do not comment, uh, do not mention really this expulsion. I thought the specialist uh, uh, references on expulsions and ethnic cleansing uh, in Europe would cover it. Strangely not. Here you have examples of such uh, comprehensive references and only the German one, Lexicon der Fertibungen, kind of touches upon uh, the expulsion in 1989 uh, of the Bulgarian Turks, but says it was not expulsion. It was just emigration, really. Uh, in in uh, Turkey, it looked like this. You had uh, uh, TV uh, news, you had newspapers uh, uh, carrying such kind of images, which are pretty harrowing if you have a look at them. 20, but in, a tur in Turkey, although it was reported, th this expulsion, when it was happening, it's not remembered either, which is, which is strange in a way. Now, 25, uh, on the 25th anniversary in 2014, some, uh, low, some you know, books were published on these events, scholarly books, books of uh, uh, memories which people had uh, from those times, those people who got expelled. But these books are extremely difficult to obtain. They were published, you know, like in 400 copies for entire Turkey. I actually got one of these two books which you uh, see here for the library in, uh, at St. Andrews, but it took me over a year to locate such a book. But why should we actually talk about the expulsion? Why should we remember about the expulsion? And uh, why should we reincorporate it into <coughs> the mainstream of European history <coughs> on the 20th century? Well, first of all, this expulsion was the largest and the most intensive in post-war Europe during the Cold War period after the wrapping up of the so-called Potsdam expulsions, meaning the expulsions of ethnic Germans, which were, uh, which were agreed at the conference uh, at Potsdam and carried out between 1946 and 1948 with some kind of wrapping up of these expulsions of ethnic Germans from what today is Poland, uh, Czechos, uh, the Czech Republic, and Hungary. This wrapping up was linking families, and this wrapping up happened at the turn of the 1950s. So it was the largest event of this kind, quote unquote, at that time. And even more uniquely, this expulsion was across the Iron Curtain uh, uh, Iron Curtain border between the Warsaw Pact and NATO. And somehow no war occurred. And the border was a very hard division. There was no freedom of going across it as you wanted, especially a mass of people in the short span of time. 
So I presume there were some negotiations at the highest level between the Warsaw Pact leaders and, the, and NATO leaders. However, no, uh, till now, no research has been done on this documentation and some of these documents remain classified still. Another important thing is that a lot of these German expellees uh, in West Germany, they were saying that people should have the, the right to homeland and that it should be a, a human right accepted by the United Nations. And the right to homeland as, as a kind of a human right got accepted uh, like uh, in 2010, so pretty, pretty recently. Another unique feature of all this expulsion was that almost half of the expellees returned. Because usually in literature on refugees and expulsions, the first case, I mean, when, when the author wants to point to the first case of the return of a large number of expellees, they, they say Kosovo. Yeah? But Kosovo actually was the second case of such a mass return. Bulgaria was the first case of it. So there are a lot of unique features. If you remember about them, you need to rewrite actually the history of the uh, of, of post-communist Europe because that history doesn't make sense in at, uh, at many crucial uh, turning points without taking into consideration the events uh, which uh, took place in Bulgaria in communist Bulgaria in 1989. Why is it important to remember about these events in Bulgaria? In Bulgaria, we have a very strange situation when it comes to talking about the dissident movements and how dissidents were, uh, were a crucial factor for convincing the uh, hardliners in the Communist Party to progress on with the systemic change. Usually, they say that uh, th there was no Valenza or Havel. There was no in Bulgaria. And they point to Zelu Zelev, who was the first post-communist president in Bulgaria, and he was a non-communist. And he was a dissident, fine. He was writing his stuff. He was expelled from the Communist Party in the 70s, if I remember correctly. He was exiled from Sofia. He had to live in the hometown of his wife. But he never created any mass movement. There is one guy who created mass movements. It's Ahmed Doan, but he's not credited with it. And his, uh, and his uh, uh, um, Turkish slash Muslim based opposition in Bulgaria was the only serious mass dissident movement in 1989. And uh, I sense that Ahmed Doan is not uh, celebrated as he should in Bulgaria because he's ethnic Turk. Yeah? But you could point out to Romania, the guy who started this kind of changes or an, uh, events around a guy who, uh, the event which started the changes in Romania was uh, Laszlo Tukes. He is an ethnic Hungarian, but somehow Laszlo Tukes is remembered. But Laszlo Tukes didn't create any mass movement, and Ahmed Doan did, but still he is not remembered. So Bulgarian history needs uh, to be rewritten in order to reflect uh, uh, the events on the ground, I would say. Then, once again, as I've already said, after uh, the end of communism in Bulgaria, this transition period was conditioned by peaceful and negotiated cooperation between this Turkish slash Muslim party, uh, MRF, and the Communist Party, which was renamed the Socialist B Bulgarian Party, and the opposition parties, coalition of the opposition parties led by Zelu Zelev, and they were cooperating in the face of this massive anti-Muslim, anti-Turkish demonstrations which dominated social and political life of Bulgaria in 1990 and 91. So it was an achievement. And they were pointing actually across the border to Yugoslavia, look what happens if we don't negotiate. So they negotiated and they prevented the breakup of uh, Bulgaria or a civil war in Bulgaria. And this party, um, uh, 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 the uh, MRF, remains the pillar of stability of Bulgarian uh, politics. 
because it hasn't splinter, it hasn't changed its name, and it has consistently participated uh, uh, in uh, governing Bulgaria in every ruling coalition or through the, um, through the parliament supporting a ruling coalition in the parliament. Well, the difficult point is that if what happened was ethnic cleansing, then uh, Todor Zhivkov, who ruled Bal communist Bulgaria for 35 years, should be re recognized as an ethnic cleanser. If, uh, 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 if Slobona Milosevic and uh, Radovan Karadzic are rightly so uh, recognized as ethnic cleansers, the same label should be applied to any politicians who did similar things. And somehow, it's uh, not, uh, this label is still not applied to Todor Zhivkov. Although, as I've already mentioned, uh, uh, talking about these references about expulsions, uh, they refer to what happened in Bulgaria as emigration, not even forced emigration. The very Bulgarian parliament in 2012 recognized what happened as ethnic cleansing. So, wow, even the Bulgarians now see it, but somehow, Although the parliament uh, uh, adopted this declaration after two years in, uh, the, 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 the declaration was negotiated and discussed in the parliament for two years, so it took really long. Uh, somehow the books are not getting rewritten in Bulgaria and no one remembers uh, uh, these events in Bulgaria or abroad. Truly speaking, people who were born uh, in the 80s in Bulgaria uh, when you ask them in the street if they heard about this expulsion, not at all. So, but if we recognize that Zhivkov was ethnic cleanser, then we have to ask another question. Was he the only ethnic cleanser? What about his uh, closest uh, uh, collaborators who were actually running the gov uh, government uh, of Komis or uh, Bulgaria? And these guys, uh, were actually helping Zhivkov to organize this ethnic cleansing, and some of these guys became post-communist politicians. Nothing happened. And even, st even a more strange development happened. Uh, Zhivkov, although he was, uh, he was put into the dock for a short period of time, all the accusations against him were dropped, and he was never accused of uh, starting and overseeing this ethnic cleansing. And beginning uh, in 94, 95, he, the most strangest development ever, the personality cult of Zhivko. <laughs> the real life uh, personality cult of Zhivko started developing in post-communist Bulgaria, obviously against the background of the economic difficulties of the transition period. And, uh, and, and here, there is something which is really bothering me as a European, as a person who believes uh, in the ideal of stability and peace and democracy. Boyko Borisov, who is the current uh, Bulgarian prime minister, uh, he, was, uh, uh, a he, he was an employee of the Ministry of Internal Affairs, meaning the security forces in the latter half of the 1980s, and he, in one way or another, we don't, uh, we don't know the details, was responsible for carrying out this ethnic cleansing. And, and in 1989, became the personal bodyguard of uh, Boris, uh, Boris Zhivkov. So the glory of Boris Zhivkov was kind of being reflected onto uh, Boyko Borisov, which helped him with becoming a politician and uh, the mayor of ba uh, Sofia and then uh, uh, the, mini the Minister of uh, Internal Affairs, so there's a certain continuity, you could say, and then the Bulgarian Prime Minister in, uh, in 2010. The strange thing is that Boyko Borisov is officially praising, uh, praising uh, uh, Zhivkov as uh, Nash uh, Velikitato, our great daddy. And it is not acceptable nowadays in Europe, in democratic Europe, for a politician, for a leader of the country to praise an ethnic cleanser. Let's say some people may like 
Milosevic or Radovan Karadzic here, but not a single uh, Serbian minister or president officially is, is, is praising Mil Mil Milosevic or, or, or Karadzic. Correct me if I'm wrong. I'm, I mean, I'm not a specialist in uh, Serbian history, but I haven't come across such official statements yet. The only European politicians who's claiming a non-ethnic cleanser is Vladimir Putin. He's reviving the person. And, and Croatia, I must say that. Okay, fine. Croatia, too. They are, they, they, I like Serbia, they 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 like Serbia, and I, look, I'm writing a book about it. I'm, I'm, that's why I'm here. That's why I'm happy to hear your comments. Uh, do uh, Croatian uh, prime minister or president uh, praise uh, Tujman? Of course, yes. Okay. Yeah. Good. So I can, So I have to correct it. Fine. Okay. I have to correct it. Yeah. So. But let's say, just to mention, no, not, not, uh, no German chancellor is praising Hitler. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so probably that's the standard, and we should keep to this golden standard, I would say, if we, if we want to have peaceful Europe. And here you have some kind of pictures from when he was still alive and he became the object of his own personality uh, cult, probably to his own surprise. And that's one of the stranger things ever, because these people who are greeting here Zhivkov are people whom he was ethnically cleansing, because the situation was so desperate I don't know how it was done, but uh, these are Pomaks, Bulgarian Muslims, and uh, in the villages he was loaded as, you know, our great leader. Don't ask me about, about the psychology of it, probably that's the Stockholm syndrome, yeah, that uh, victims are sympathizing with the perpetrators. And wow, when he died, there was a big talk about his, uh, uh, there was a big talk with the government who refused state funeral to Zhivko. Look, it was not official. It was not a state funeral. What was that? If, if you have a look at this picture. Yeah, so Boyko Borisov, he became prime minister in 2009, so pr practically without a break, he's ruling Bulgaria until today. And some uh, bloggers are commenting about the similarity of Zhivkov and Borisov. Obviously, it is unofficial. Officially, you do not find it. And uh, that's the burgeoning uh, uh, personality cult of uh, Zhivkov in Pravets, uh, in his uh, uh, town, in his ho uh, hometown. These monuments, the, 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 the monument on my, on my, on my right uh, is the old monument from the 80s, which was uh, uh, put in Pravet, but Zhivkov didn't like it. He didn't want any personality cult, so it, would, it was put into a, sto into a storage room. But uh, in the mid-90s, after his death, it was put uh, back on the pedestal, and some new monuments were put, like the, the, the one on my, on, on my left, with this kind of uh, motto from his book. You know, like every communist leader, he wrote like 30 volumes of his works, which are gathering dust in the uh, libraries. But uh, in 96, his memoirs were published, which became a runaway bestseller. And uh, the conclusion of this memoir is like this. I use all the power I had for the good of my nation. Yeah, well, what does it mean? OK, I'll leave to you to think about it. And these celebrations uh, in, in private are happening every year on the anniversary of his birth in September. So. You have some pictures. And you have even this kind of billboards, capitalist style billboards across the country inviting, come and celebrate uh, our, our guy. And some new monuments are um, also unveiled across uh, the country, like in Odarne, uh, uh, Odurne, uh, in 2013. And Zhivko has had nothing to do even with this uh, place. Well, I propose that in order to understand better the modern history of post-communist Europe, the process of post-communist transition, the fall of communists, and the post-communist democratizing transition in Central Europe, in Bulgaria, it is crucial to remember about the events in Bulgaria. And if we remember now about the Goliamata Promenade, the big change, Divende, 
uh, and you can come across uh, it uh, uh, in uh, this term in the books. We should also remember about the two other Golemata, the two other big ones, the Golemata, uh, the Golemata ex uh, um, excursia, the big excursion, this expulsion, and the Golemata Zabrashtanie, the big return. Without remembering about these two crucial elements, it is impossible to understand uh, the politics of uh, today's Bulgaria and the recent history of Bulgaria and post-communist Europe. It is also of much import for Turkey. Although in Turkey, as, as you've noticed, they kind of remember it at the low-key uh, low level, but they don't remember it as part of the recent history of Turkey. However, it brushes off onto the recent history of Turkey in a big way, because despite that th the fact that the expulsion was happening across the Iron Curtain border between war the Warsaw Pact and NATO, no war ensued, which is a question which, which, which leads to the question, why not? How was it negotiated? Then th around 300,000 uh, Bulgarian Turks uh, have now dual citizenship. They live either in Turkey or in Bulgaria, but they have dual citizenship because the expellees who decided to stay in Turkey, they were conferred automatically in uh, uh, 1990 and 1991 with Turkish citizenship, which is very unusual for Turkey to do because Turkey is pretty stingy with its citizenship, like Bulgaria in a way. Then Bulgaria is the only post-communist country in Europe which has a visa-free uh, travel regime with, with Turkey, which is also uh, telling. On the other hand, uh, uh, the number of Turk uh, in today's Turkey who were born in Bulgaria is 370,000, so it's a big community. And the community, is uh, good to remember, is concentrated in the European part of Turkey, just across the border, not across Anatolia. And uh, the Turks are the largest minority in uh, today's uh, Bulgaria. So from the perspective of Turkey, you would think it would be an important, uh, these would be important elements which have to be incorporated into the research on the recent Turkish history. Somehow it's not happening. I have, I have no clue why. I, I don't read Turkish. Okay. As I promised uh, to Igor, uh, at the end I would like to present a certain hypothesis which I develop on the basis of the fact that I found out that uh, the only newspapers at the time in the summer of 1989 which were covering the expulsion on front pages uh, were in Yugoslavia and in uh, Turkey. So if Yugoslavia, I mean, the, 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 the because it was reported so widely in the newspapers. It is not to say that it was not reported in the West. It was reported in the West. But as I've already said, the articles from Bulgaria in the Guardian and in the Times, I found around 60 articles about this event, so a lot, you would say. But not a single one made it to the front page. They were usually buried in the middle of the newspapers. Uh, as, uh, so basically, they escaped the attention of the readers. However, if, because the, uh, the articles were on the front pages of many Yugoslav newspapers, not only the main ones, the statewide ones like Borba and Politica, but also in the regional ones, as I found out, uh, because I did some research in Slovenia and in Croatia, the, 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 the articles about the events were published in the Republican newspapers over there. And I suspect that there were more articles of this kind in the Republican newspapers in Macedonia, but I haven't had time, haven't had uh, the means uh, to do research on the Macedonian newspapers. So, and as I uh, told uh, Igor when I was talking to him before the lecture, the first expellees were the, the, the leaders or the perceived leaders of the Turkish mu slash Muslim opposition who led and organized uh, under the, 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 the leadership of Ahmed Doan the uh, Turkish protest, Muslim protest in April 1989. 
preceding the, the, the expulsion, actually causing the expulsion, because Zhivkov was exasperated with the situation and decided to get rid of these people. And uh, the, uh, the, the Turkish leaders of this protest were expelled uh, first of all to Belgrade and then to Vienna. So the Yugoslav diplomats, Yugoslav leaders knew very well uh, about the events uh, and they were negotiating uh, uh, the, the mechanics of this expulsion of the leaders uh, with uh, uh, Zhivkov. So they also knew that neither the East, meaning the Soviet Union and later on Russia, nor the West, meaning the United States, Western Europe, NATO, reacted to this expulsion. Yeah? So in a way, expulsions were fine. You could do them. And that's why I think Tujman, Karadzic, Izetbegovic kind of engaged freely in the policy of expulsion nowadays known as ethnic cleansing because they realized <laughs> that the international community would not react. How, the, how come did they realize that? Because that what happened in Bulgaria. The international community did not react in any uh, way which would stop the, the expulsions. So in a way, when, when, when uh, in 95, uh, the NATO reacted, the West reacted, Karadzic and Milosevic and the other guys were surprised because the rules of the game were changed. And, uh, well, it should be reflected upon and the change should be uh, analyzed and applied to how we think about the history of uh, post-communist uh, Europe. Because without this reflection, Although we have thousands upon thousands of books about the wars in Yugoslavia and post-Yugoslav uh, po post countries and this Yugoslav conflict and tens of thousands of articles, I read through them when I was doing research with, for my student and during the last 20 years, and there is this, this kind of exasperation in these articles. How on earth, after the Second World War, after the Holocaust, in the civilized 20th century Europe, such a thing happened again. And they say, wow, we don't know, that's crazy. But it's not crazy if you remember about what happened in Bulgaria. Yeah. That was pretty logical. So how, what was this change in thinking about uh, international law and what is right, what is wrong, war wrong, and what is a crime against humanity? Basically, between 1918 and the post-Yugoslav wars, the expulsion, expulsion, expulsions were known in international law as population transfers. And they were legal. They were actually considered to be an instrument for furthering human rights and providing stability. Obviously, people who were doing it, they realized lives hundreds of thousands of people were destroyed, but still they thought it was better to do this than to have some ethnic war. Fine, that was the thinking in the post, uh, post, uh, post uh, in the Cold War period. Population transfers are fine, although they are not liked, but they are legal. Then, the new term appeared under the influence of Yugoslav newspapers which described what was happening in Bosnia uh, as ethnic očišćenje. It was translated as ethnic cleansing and ethnic cleansing in 1995 was declared to be a crime against humanity and there was a string of the laws uh, which were coming to the, uh, uh, to the Rome Treaty and the establishment of the International Criminal Court where ethnic cleansing is uh, uh, explicitly uh, defined as a crime against humanity. S but what is ethnic cleansing? Ethnic cleansing is this population transfer. So population transfer 
was, which was an instrument of human rights, was <laughs> renamed as ethnic cleansing and was recognized as, as a crime against humanity. I'm both hands for this definition, yeah? But we should remember about this change in international law and in thinking uh, about international politics because if you remember about this and what happened in Bulgaria, out of sudden you can explain why Karadzic Milosevic thought they would be able to carry out uh, expul uh, ethnic, ethnic cleansing, acts of ethnic cleansing with impunity. Now, what about the responsibility? And here there's an interesting uh, thing because obviously Zhivkov died in 98, so uh, like 14 years uh, before uh, 2012 when the Bulgarian parliament recognized uh, uh, the expulsion in, of eight, 1989 as an act of ethnic cleansing. However, Zhivkov, people knew, was personally responsible for governing Bulgaria, communist Bulgaria, and it was him who ordered the uh, expulsion of Turks, uh, Muslims from Bulgaria, which led to the loss of property, the loss of accommodation, uh, the loss of income, the loss of jobs. So many people were wronged. And uh, on other legal basis, he could have been brought to the dock and uh, be, re be, be held responsible for what he did. But he never was. And that's kind of strangely compares uh, with uh, you know how uh, how Yugoslav uh, leaders were brought uh, to the dock pretty speedily uh, for uh, what they did by the way of crimes against humanity in the post-Yugoslav wars, and there is a worrying pattern developing if we don't remember about what happened in Bulgaria that we have kind of ethnic cleansers of two types uh, nowadays in Europe those who are kind of accepted and they are not punished, and those who are, uh, who are branded as uh, criminals and are punished. And that's wrong. Thank you very much. <laughs>